Is every business a tech business? In the future, yes. Ultimately, ed tech is a motivation problem. About only 3% of the people who start an online self-paced program finish it. I think there's you guys, there's Master Union, there's Stoa. How do you differentiate versus them? We are always preparing you for the future. Name the top tech companies in the country. Chances are you're going to find a skiller alumni there already. You've probably been asked questions about Devin a hundred times now, right? Basically, it makes a software engineer maybe 5x or 10x more productive. Some of those people competing against you are freaks of motivation. Students today are far less satisfied with their own achievements than I think you and I used to be. Ladies and gentlemen, today I'm with Abhimanyu and Bhavik. I think these guys are some of the most fantastic people in edtech. Uh, Abhimanyu has been running Scalar for a very, very long time. Uh, you know, sometimes I keep texting him. He has lots of insights in the edtech world. He also has the most counterintuitive insights in the edtech world, which is he thinks very differently. Uh, there are a lot of insights where I don't think the average person would agree with him. And I think today we'll go over everything, right? Today we'll go over future of software programming, we'll go over future of business with AI coming out, we'll go over Devin, what, what is really Devin going to do? We'll also go over their stories. And hopefully by the end of it, you walk away learning a little more about how online and offline education businesses work. And you also kind of get a view of how the nature of business will probably change over the next few years. We'll also learn a little bit more about tier one, tier two, and tier three colleges. So stay tuned. Ladies and gentlemen, so, you know, I think in December, I reached out to Abhimanyu and I said, uh, Abhimanyu runs Scalar. And I said, you should come and be on a podcast with me because Scalar has actually been one of the startup successes in India, right? They've They've been around for a very, very long time. I've known you since interview bit. So they've done a phenomenal job. And I think some of that story deserves to be highlighted. And I also think because software is changing so rapidly. And also, I think because software is changing rapidly and every business sort of become like a tech business, business is changing rapidly, right? So both software and business, I know you guys have a lot of insights on. And I thought having a podcast, having both of you on and just, you know, understanding your story, your thoughts, some of the counterintuitive insights that you've had about uh, teaching code, about teaching business. I want to know all of it, right? So welcome to the show. I think before anything, I want both of you to introduce yourself uh, from, you know, ideally from your childhood, what, yeah, I'm, I'm sure some people, you know, they, they say this, right? Like from early years, you were exhibiting something different. Yeah. So I want to know from both of you, you are allowed to brag for the next, you know, one minute or so, but I'll start with your way. So I am very, I think now looking back, it looks, it's not a very common journey that I had. I grew up in a very, very small town uh, in MP called Amar Kantak. Uh, it is a village within, a, a, you know, kind of, you know, tribal district. It was, it used to be the largest tribal district uh, of the country called Shahdol. Uh, Amarkantak also is a, a famous in the, like, older people know about it because it's a very old city. It has its uh, mentions in the Ramayanas and Mahabharatas. Uh, so Ram back in the day spent some time of his, when he was doing the Vanvas, he spent some time there. Um, so it's it's on a hill. It's very interesting that it's a hill station with an MP. Uh, back in the days, early 90s, when I was growing up, uh, it was a town with no telephone line whatsoever. The newspaper used to get delivered the next day, uh, the national newspapers, because it's so remote that, you know, on the same day, there's no logistical network to deliver the newspaper same day. Uh, so I, I, I uh, spent very early childhood there. And then after school, I, I went to IIIT Hyderabad. Uh, so another interesting thing is that uh, while IIIT Hyderabad is considered the mecca for the computer science in India, before ending up there, I had never used computer in my life. I had only seen it from a distance because every year in 10th class, 12th class, you will have your results being declared or the results of competitive exams. Uh, so you'll go to the only cyber cafe in the city to get your results. So from afar, you can see it. There's a computer on which the operator will take out the result, give you a print and charge 10 rupees for that. Uh, so that was my interaction with computer. When I entered college, uh, now it's like, you know, like in the middle of Hyderabad, surrounded by, like I remember, Microsoft shared boundary with our campus, um, then Google a kilometer down, and then there is a TCS campus right across the corner. Infosys is a huge campus of maybe 150, 150 acres right across. What I feel is that growing up in this small town, away from, you know, the fancy schools, uh, etc., Sometimes people say it's a disadvantage. I feel it was a huge advantage. Yeah. Because it kind of kept that natural curiosity 
uh, and you know the and hunger and hunger that you know like there is nothing like basically i was never motivated to just like you know no facts i would look at things i'll try to understand what is happening uh, what should be happening uh, question the status quo and because of that i was able to often take decisions which would not be usual decisions it could be for example back in 2006 when i decided to join triple it hyderabad i had options to join even you know more older famous established institutes i i remember my late father he was pretty unhappy with me because triple it hyderabad back back then almost 15 years now yeah uh, rather 20 close to 20 years now 18 20 years triple it hyderabad was not a very famous college back then today it's, of course it's a very sought after institute and like i just as a 17 18 year old kid i kind of made this rebellious decision that i will not go to some of the 50 80 year old famous sort of to colleges but i would rather go to triple it hyderabad because because i could see that you know what i want to study what i want to do that is happening there um similarly when i had to like you know choice of jobs uh, i joined so before starting scalar i i uh, worked at fab for a while when i joined them it was a company with five people and with maybe just a million or two in investment right i had option of let's say going to a company with 10000 employees fortune 500 or maybe fortune 100 i turned that down took this up again not a decision that many people managed to take and then four years into that then i again managed to take a decision that i was doing i was fairly comfortable in the job uh making decent enough money for myself doing decent in the job appreciated by the peers and and the and the bosses but then again again my father was confused ki why would you quit this everything is so sorted people aspire to get to at such a place why would you quit that and want to build something of your own right so i think uh, this overall have been my journey and i think uh, i attribute a lot of that to you know the environment i was part of between when i was 5 year old to 15 year old in a remote small place where you get to think from first principles mm-hmm. not in a rat race that i must clear this exam i must do this i must, this is a chase uh, being away from that i think was very helpful while growing up so bhavik you literally run uber in india what's your story like how do you get to running uber in india sure um, very different journey altogether born and raised uh, in south bombay on a silver spoon it's like you guys are polar opposites <laughs> polar opposites i grew up in a fancy apartment in south bombay typical marwadi family uh, business family textiles um you know had all the luxuries that i could ask for uh, growing up uh, did my schooling in in south bombay as well then i did my junior college also in in south bombay uh and then i did my engineering uh which was in university of mumbai and by the time i was in the third year of engineering uh two things happened that defined a lot of the things that happened for me uh in my future life one was my family business that my father was running went through substantial losses they had to shut down the entire business uh repay a lot of the loans that led to family disputes and pretty much going from living in south bombay fancy apartments we were down to essentially living in a rental apartment uh struggling to just make ends meet um simultaneously when i was in my third of engineering i almost decided to quit engineering and uh, the reason for that was because i just felt i was wasting my time there right um typical traditional engineering college didn't feel like i was learning enough there was no motivation at all on one side i'm seeing my father struggle through his you know fiascos that happened in the business the, the factory etc on the other hand i'm like i'm spending time here i'm not even learning much that i can take back home with me and you know sort of almost had this rate of conversation that you have with your father once in your life across the table i'm like dad i want to quit mm-hmm. and like what do you mean he like i don't want to do engineering anymore i'm okay i'll join you instead right because i felt like you need me and my dad of course sat me down like you're third year already it's just one more year just get a degree mm-hmm. we'll figure it out later so i went ahead finished my four years of engineering i was good in studies after graduating Uh, we had about five or six companies that came on campus to hire. I sat for zero interviews. I was very clear I was going to go work with my dad, and he was restarting his factory for manufacturing shirts. Uh, so I thought I'll go join him. I survived for three months, and I realized this is not my place at all. Like this, I can't, I can't handle uh, the the requirements of you know the labor that goes into uh, running a family business, the factory, etc. So my dad is like, this is not for you. I'm okay. I'll run this for how long I can, and I'll gradually shut it down. You got to move on. 
Uh, and that's when I took up my first job, which was actually a software developer with a company called Atos Origin, mm -hmm. among the top IT consulting firms back then, uh, providing IT services for uh, European region. They're based in Belgium, Netherlands, and, and Luxembourg, primarily. Did that for almost about two years. And while I was working there, I did a lot of programming in a very old language. It was actually a fourth generation language called Progress. Mm -hmm. It mimicked C++ to some extent. Mm -hmm. Did coding for roughly about, about two years. Realized I am a good engineer, but I'm a terrible coder. Just right. one very interesting trivia there. Huh. So you were write, uh, writing 4GL of Progress. Right. During my college days, I was doing internship for Progress and I was building the 4GL programming language. <laughs> <laughs> so we may have Very interesting. <laughs> interesting. My, yeah. my first programming language was Delphi. I'm just putting it in the hat right there <laughs> with you guys. No, so, so did some programming progress, but I think the, what's interesting, the project I was working on was basically a manufacturing company that was based out of the US. Yeah. And I was building the entire freight solution along with the team. And that got me really curious to understand, okay, what I'm doing sitting in a silo in a small part of Mumbai, how is that really impacting the entire business? I started Googling a lot about the business itself, about the company. Yeah. I was going to go QAD, I remember even now. Um, I'm like, what does this company really do? What are all different parts of the business? I started getting really curious about it. And I did a diploma in financial management at Narsi Monji. Yeah. Uh, so I used to do a part-time course, work through the day, and go in the evenings for these classes. And that got me further interested into understanding just the different facets of business in the first place. So a product of I'm a product of engineering, but started gravitating towards understanding all parts of the business. Doing that made me realize that there was more to learn about the business, but the diploma enough wasn't enough, right? Diploma by itself wasn't enough, uh, which is why I applied for university abroad and I did my uh, master's in general management and finance uh, at University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign uh, in the US. I spent about two years doing that. Fundamentally changed me. First time I was away from home. You know, making my own bed, cooking my own food, interacting with people from all over the world. Um, I think there were people from roughly about 50 different nations, part of my classroom, learning different cultures. Uh, and more importantly, really getting into the meat of understanding business in general. There was a specific thing that the program had which drew me towards that program, which was called Illinois Business Consulting. It was a consulting firm that was run by the students on campus that was sourced real world projects. And then through all those experiences, started learning about the differences in business outside of India and in the booming business ecosystem that was happening in India as well. At that point in time, Flipkart was just getting started back in 2010. Got gravitated back towards coming home. So left the gig, uh, left a very high paying consulting job, six figure dollar salary. I'm saying, this is it. I want to go back and build something. Came back, uh, did my first startup, which is called Employee Social, uh, which is providing rewards and recognition programs to large companies like Siemens, Bajaj, IBM. Those are some of the clients that we manage Ran that up until 2013, when serendipitously got connected with folks at Uber. Um, met Travis through an online call. He told me what Uber is. At that point, I knew what Uber was. And this is, remember, pre-Uber days in India, right? So Uber was just in about 20 cities in the US. And the only international city they were live in at that point in time was in Paris. And they were looking to expand globally at that point in time. And looking for their founding leader to start the Uber India business. Not knowing what Uber was, went through a three month long interview process with them. I think that lasted about 12 interviews and about four countries. Mm -hmm. I had to fly around many places for interviews. They flew me to SF, they flew me to Toronto, they flew me to Singapore and India as well. And then finally landed the gig to be the founding leader for Uber in India. Um, so left my own startup because I just felt like it was a lifetime, you know, once in a lifetime opportunity to getting a chance to build what I felt was going to be the next big thing in the country, which is going to fundamentally reshape logistics and transportation in every country in the, in the city, yeah. right? And we've all faced those issues, so we know what we're, what we're talking about. Joined Uber, founding leader. I started off from a cafe coffee day just down the road, actually, Vital Mali Road. Mm -hmm. was my first office at Uber. Uh, set up the entity, hired the first set of people, started the Uber business, scaled that across the country. Uh, pretty much all the products that you see on the Uber app, whether it was back in the day, Uber Black, mm -hmm. down to Uber Go, Uber Premium, Uber Commute, Uber Moto, Uber Auto, were all launched by me between 2013 and 2016, and expanded across India, Sri Lanka, and Bangladesh with the rights business. And I went back into uh, building and became also the founding leader and the head of Uber Eats for India and South Asia. I then built Uber Eats over the next three years. Um, launched Uber Eats in 40 cities in India, launched in Sri Lanka, launched in Bangladesh, and then ran that up until 2019 before Uber went IPO. And then once there was a push to become profitable, we were looking to exit businesses that required significant investments moving forward. And India was one of them. 
So we ended up exiting Uber Eats to Zomato, which you may have heard of back in 2019. Uh, after that, just free you know, agent. Sorry? After that, free agent. After the free agent, I had the op uh, opportunity to move to uh, Singapore and head Uber Eats for the APAC business. Somehow my heart lied in where we are today in India and felt there was just so much to do here. Awesome. So, uh, you know, I've been following Scalar's story for a while, right? And I've seen Scalar evolve from interview bait, small business. Like, we've met yeah. often, right? Yeah. And I think one of the things that's been phenomenal is this transition that you have had from an online business during like the peak of the pandemic where nobody could do anything offline to now also building like a very, very strong offline business. I've seen this in a lot of other ed techs as well, right? Where Pele, I think, actually it's not even ed techs, right? I think it's all startups and businesses like a Nika would do the same thing, right? Where there's a lot of brand building that happens online. There's a product that's sold online as well. And then eventually they go offline. What was the thought process here? What's the play here? I can talk about in our context, right? And uh, there have been a very interesting evolution over the last almost 9, 10 years since we started. So me and Anjuman, we started building in late 2020, uh, 2014, right? So now it's like just in six months, it will be almost a decade since we started. Our first hypothesis, as you said, was interview bit, right? The problem statement that we started with in early 2014, when we were figuring out that what would we want to build uh, as a company, that problem statement has absolutely remained the same. The problem statement was that people do not, a large chunk of youth in India, does not have the capability, the knowledge, the thinking process, uh, and skills to become very high performance, high impact for the industry. And both these young folks, they're hardworking, they're smart, but they do not have a systematic way to build the skills that the industry demands. Industry, on the other hand, in a way, it's bottleneck for them with the kind of talent they can hire to expand further. Right? So we want this was the problem statement that how do we fix this gap between the two? The first solution that we built was interview bit. Right? It was very simple. Our initial hypothesis was that if you build a structured curriculum, which is step by step, perfectly aligned to what companies are looking for. Right? Now, Interviews is a great reflection of that, let's say if you want to hire someone, in the interviews you are going to thoroughly uh, drill down on that do you possess those capabilities or not. Right? So interview bit was built as a gamified almost duolingo for programmers, where you step by step go through uh, the journey, you spend maybe a few hours every day, you do that for six months, and if you finish the entire journey, you would have enough knowledge and skills where you can clear the interviews of good tech companies, which it did achieve. So interview bit as uh, like I, it's it's pretty common that on an airport or or you know in a mall uh, someone will come and ask me that uh, you are a woman who built interview bit right? Mm -hmm. Lot of people used it almost like a huge chunk of people in their final year of engineering they would use interview bit to prepare for their placements. But then it had very like if I go with the intellectual honesty and ask myself that was like me and Anshuman we asked ourselves. Is interview bit solving the problem that we want to solve fully? The answer was no. And I'll tell you the reason. With most online programs, which is self-paced, the issue is that the completion rates are extremely low. There is a study of MIT which talks about that even MIT has, for example, launched many of the on MIT X Pro, I guess they've launched a lot of online programs, right? They publicly they have this data uh, that about only 3% of the people who start an online self-paced program finish it. I think it's less than that. Like I have this yeah. I have this one channel called Varunmaya Level 2 where I did a full Unreal Engine course, right? Both yeah. the design as well as co code, right? We even covered oops. Yeah. First episode some whatever, lots of views, right? Second last episode, I still remember till today, it's like 50 or 80 views or something like that. It's like just 50 episodes, yeah. right? And people just quit. Like right. I, I, I started learning this, I think especially in the last 3-4 years that Ultimately, edtech is a motivation problem. It's content to hai abhi, right? right? And it's always been there actually. If you're willing no, so to books, study a textbook. For example, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's always there in the books, right? Uh, like yeah. people say ki all the knowledge is on internet. All the knowledge is also there in the books. But the problem is that I might buy 100 books. I would probably finish one of them. Yeah. Similarly, I might buy 100 courses, you know, online recorded courses. But like most likely I would not even one of, finish one of them, yeah. right? So we, we saw the same on interview bit as well. Like when we were young and stupid, that we are even today, but uh, we thought that, you know, let's, let's, we'll build strong gamification, we'll build, you know, try to make strong motivation. Everyone around goes it. through that, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, you this. have to go through that journey. You have to yeah. go through that journey to understand the deeper problems and then figure out solutions yeah. for that, right? Uh, what we realized that even at interview bit, uh, if I remember, the completion rates would be about 4 to 5%. 
uh, we spoke to a lot of people that uh, you know why would you not complete like you know it's free it's it's uh, you can just be at it you know that if you just keep doing it you will have a fancy job at the end of it why could you not finish right and their problem statements were very reasonable to be candid it's easy to just brush it off that oh people are just not motivated but it's it's deeper than that right most people they will like for example if you go to a, a engineering college or for that matter any university right there might be 100 things wrong about them but one good thing about a traditional college still is that there is a cohort that is studying together right in india for example if 100 like even bhavik for example in third year he wanted to quit engineering college but he didn't yeah. if 100 people start a degree 98 of them most likely end up finishing it unless there is a extreme severe situation that comes up yeah. right now if i on the flip side online learning is mostly just studying alone mm -hmm. right imagine that if you there is a college where you just go and sit in the whole classroom alone mm -hmm. and there's a video that is playing in the class you will most likely drop off from that right mm -hmm. second is if you get stuck with something if you are on a steep learning journey it's very natural that you can get stuck right again if you are just alone how do you unblock that you probably have no mentor no friend to discuss and unblock yourself with so that is how in a way idea of scaler was born right that while we like we challenged ourselves that could there be a solution which marries the scale of online hmm. but at the same time achieves the completion rates and the learning outcome of offline hmm. right? that is how scaler was born would you argue that at least with online life is a very powerful distractor and like people just have other more important things yeah. to do and this is cognitive effort exactly. uh, you know uh, i learned this when I, I don't remember which i think this was upgrade if i'm not wrong right where somebody had asked uh, somebody at upgrade said that um, you know it's not like a movie you can't go in finish 50% even in a movie you can't stand up and be like give me a refund yeah. and a movie is not cognitive cognitive effort you don't have to put thinking in right like the director is doing sure. that for you but in a course especially an online course you have to put in the thinking you have to sit study learn make notes i'm watching a scalar tutor i have to figure out what he's saying finish complete the assignment there's effort on me yeah. and you know life is such a powerful distraction like my washing machine is beeping yeah, you know uh, my girlfriend called yeah. my my mom wants me to get this yeah. everything suddenly becomes higher priority because you are doing that cognitive yeah. prioritization yeah. and it's actually lazy when you're saying this is more important than this but that's because that's how we we've, we've grown right yeah. when we were kids Yeah. our parents took care of everything right there was no self motivation that i have to make my own bed but you know it's also a cultural thing like sometimes when i sit on my computer possibly. and i'm just learning something sometimes like my mom especially when i was younger she'd be like no no don't do that do this like help possibly. me around the house possibly, right? right so i mean it, school it feels culturally example, bad to not help yeah. yeah i mean when to school yeah feel like uh, my job is to go to school school is for to teach me the right skills yeah. and get me to a 10th grade yeah. and then i same philosophy continue to college yeah. seeing so now school i've joined the college i did my bit now college has to make sure that i study and i graduate yeah. so we've always been groomed in such a way that we rely on someone else to keep motivating us to reach a completion yeah. self motivation extremely hard yeah. unless you have a very strong ambition and a goal post that hunger that i really want to get there because that means so much to my life so in all of this right i want to touch on something now a little bit different this is back to sst and scaler right i think we've seen a lot of shift with ai i think 2 years ago this wasn't even a topic of conversation right we had ai but it's a very different kind of ai yeah suddenly gpt came out you know everyone's like okay nobody has any idea what's going to happen over the next 2 3 years and i think recently we've had devin come out right there's been a i mean there's one thing that's very clear the enterprise is going to be transformed yep. okay engineers are going to be transformed absolutely and everyone has different thoughts on it there's some people who are like software engineers are gone <laughs> right and there's some people who are like no no nothing's going to happen to software engineers this is all this devin is a scam then there's a middle ground that's like actually software engineering jobs are two parts one is the actual you know writing the code code monkey job the other job is the problem solving and the thinking of what needs to be written in the first place should i even write code should i use like a existing library or framework right, right. it's more like i would say this person is a little more junior to this person but actually if you meet a software engineer most of them have both of these combined in them and as they get more senior i think the problem solving ability goes higher mm -hmm. and uh, the decision making ability goes higher and the uh, writing code reduces because you now have a team to do it that's my thought but i know that you've probably been asked questions about devin 100 times now right what do you think yeah no so i think i am a native to you know programming i like uh, like i i grew like 
I have been writing code for 15 years. Even today, I often write code. Uh, if I ask you this question, like even when I am in a hardcore full-time uh, developer role, mm. what percent of time, make a guess, what percent of time I spend writing code? Yeah. Hey, like two, three hours a day, but it it varies. Like there's some periods where you write a lot of code. There's some periods where you're just like, okay, kya hi build karna? Like what, what do we need to build yeah. in the first place? So, but I do agree that over time it's reduced. No, I can tell you that, you know, like the lesser ratio between writing code versus not writing code and like important that even when I'm not writing code, I am working as a software engineer. Mm. Typically for any good software engineer, it is only 10 to 20% of the time when you are actually writing code. Yeah. 80 to 90% of the time you are Thinking working as a hardcore software engineer, but you are not writing code. Mm. People, anyone who is in a job where 80, 90% they are only writing code, that means they are not really working as a software engineer. Yeah. Uh, now the second part that if only 10 to 20% of the time is actually spent writing code, rest of the time is actually spent figuring out what needs to be built. Mm. You know, a product manager would tell me that, you know, this is the business problem statement, this is the metric that we are chasing, this is the kind of product idea that we have, right? Mm. However, then breaking it down, that what needs to be built, what is the most efficient way to build that, that is where actual software engineers spend most of the time, right? Uh, and even if I further take it down to, you know, very abstract problem statements, you know, data structures and algorithm, for example, right? Mm. Even there, if I read a problem, let's say if, if, if I talk about, let's say, 8, 9, 10, 10, 11 years back, I might have given an interview. And even when I coach, the, uh, you know, students uh, at Scalar that uh, what is the way to have high performance even in a programming interview, that when that problem is thrown at you, if you jump into writing code immediately, most likely you are rejected right there. You have to start with first making sure that you understand the problem correctly. Mm. Then you build the solution. Then you cross-verify the solution. Mm. Probably in a 60-minute coding interview, you are supposed to spend only 5 to 10 minutes writing the code. Mm. That is when it is considered a high-quality interview, be it Google's interview, be it Microsoft's interview, be it Amazon's interview. Mm. Right? That is what software engineers really do. Mm. Right? And then come day win. Two parts to it. What I feel is that one, of course, even Devin, even right now is not in public beta. It's, yeah. it's kind of a controlled environment. Years. It will take years to get there. But I'm optimistic it will get there where it in reality starts behaving how that those demo Demos, videos, yeah. uh, today it is not. Right. Yeah. Second is that even then, what it makes is that basically it makes a software engineer maybe 5x or 10x more productive. Mm. Because that 20% time, Sometimes I might have to just write boilerplate code where I just don't have to think, but I still have to write it, mm. right? Or I have to copy paste it from somewhere. And we've seen this with abstractions, right? Like yeah. I used to write a lot of Ruby code. Yeah. In the beginning, everyone's like writing authentication by themselves. Yeah. Today, nobody does that. Yeah. They'll just pick up a, it, in Ruby, it's called yeah. gems. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so you just pick up you'll a gem use a gem authentication and, you'll, yeah. and you'll just be like, my job's done. Right. So anyway, we've seen that with abstraction. And because a lot of code is boilerplate code, now you only have to solve like the most high value, important, yeah. different problems than anybody else is facing. But you were saying. Yeah. So second layer, you know, one part is that definitely it's, it is another level of abstraction. Yeah. If I compare with, let's say, even 20, 25 years back, mm -hmm. people were using, you know, languages like Fortran, like even before people used to use punch cards. Punch right? cards, yeah. So these abstractions have come in, right? The productivity of a developer back in, say, 75 yeah. probably became 10x by 95. It probably became further 5x by 2015. By 2025, probably it will again increase by 4x, 5x. There is so much more technology to be built, and then each developer can become so much more productive, yeah. right? This is one level, right? What it will mean is that it will give tools to the developers who learn these thoroughly to become much more capable. Mm -hmm. Second is, then some people might argue that, okay, but that 80% thinking part, the AI is developing so fast that what if it takes over on that as well, mm -hmm. right? That is, I think, where it gets very interesting that are we saying that, see, the work that a software developer do in that 80% of the time is actually thinking about a lot of trade-offs, different mm -hmm. options, what, in what particular real-world scenario, what kind of trade-offs are right yeah. to choose. That That's is a very smart way to put it. Right? And that is what even a CEO of the company is doing. Mm -hmm. And then if we are saying that if AI gets so smart that it can replace that 70-80% thinking part, then it's a very different question. Then probably we get to a world where no one has to do anything. Mm -hmm. It's not just the software developers, then, then probably not, even the CEO doesn't have to do anything. Mm -hmm. Which I think becomes then a philosophical question that even whether if that is even possible or not. I have a theory around that. 
I, I don't think, I mean, companies will still have CEOs. Somebody still needs to be accountable and AI can't really be accountable today, right? And you as a CEO, for example, you don't have the bandwidth to sit and solve all the problems that are in the company. So even if an AI can do it on your behalf, you'd still want somebody to allow for it. You might hire less engineers, but you'll still be like, you're an engineer, you solve whatever problem comes our way. You make the decisions because I don't have the context to do 500 things a day. So smaller teams, but still, you know, more productive teams. But I do think that fundamentally, um, business will get reshaped. Yeah, that was my next question yeah. actually. Like, yeah. if if all this is going to happen and your devs suddenly become 10x more productive right. and they're, they're able to build 10 times more things and, you know, your time to production is like two months, then what happens to like a business? Yeah. Is so every I, business a tech business? In the future, yes. In the future, every business a tech business and a business that's not a tech business will likely struggle to keep up with the growing demands of the, con of the consumer. So I fundamentally believe that technological advancements, including you know, AI or Gen AI for that matter, will fundamentally reshape the way business is done in the future. Just like many of them have already changed. If you just look at the journeys of all businesses that have happened over the last, let's say over 100 years, they've transformed every few decades because of certain new technologies that have come in. Uh, whether it's industrial revolution that's come in, whether it's new tools that have come in, whether it's computers that have came in, uh, gadgets that came in, they've fundamentally reshaped businesses. And that's likely to continue as well. Which is why I think, like, to, uh, take an example of a Gen AI, right, as an example. Like, you could be a business leader, and today if you want to prototype something mm -hmm. and do a little bit of A-B testing in the market, your current way of doing that is right now, go to a team of engineers and say, can you build these, this prototype for me? I want to do A-B testing, mm -hmm. and you'll take that to the market. But you're still dependent on the tech team to take bandwidth out to build this prototype for you. Mm -hmm. Today... You're a business leader. If you have a basic understanding of how Gen AI works now, Gen AI can help you in your business. You can build a quick and dirty prototype. It may not be very polished. It'll be a dirty prototype. Quickly take it to market. Do a quick A-B testing. So time to market significantly faster. Quick feedback. Then you know exactly is this working, not working. And now I take bandwidth from a tech team to build a product full-fledged. So you, what you've done is you have learned much faster. You've got feedback much faster. And you've used your resources a lot more efficiently than you would have otherwise have in building something that may or may not have worked. Mm -hmm. And now AI is going to help you do that much faster as well. So fundamentally, a lot of these aspects of business will change. Back in the day, we would think about marketing to be limited purely to ATL, mm -hmm. right? ATL marketing, then BTL marketing. Can now you explain have, that for the audience? So about the line marketing, which is your traditional advertisements, then your below the line marketing, which is kind of events that you do, mm -hmm. or you know, uh, brand campus that you do at localized events. And then you now have performance marketing, mm -hmm. right? Now, future business leaders that are evolving in the space of marketing will have to stay abreast mm -hmm. with all the new different devices and gadgets consumers are consuming. Mm -hmm. You and I are on Instagram today. You and I are on YouTube today. We are on LinkedIn today. Whether it's Snapchat or many more that will come and then be different gadgets and different tools that will keep coming as well. As a marketing person, I need to know where are my consumers and what are they using and what algorithms these platforms have for me to target this consumer properly. Would you argue, and yeah. you know, this is something I'm picking up from what you're saying, would you argue that it's getting easier and easier, especially with Gen AI to build products, but it's getting harder to get users? Would you argue that? Or do you think that both are equally important and you're trying to... You know? Yeah, I think both are equally important. I think both are solving two different problems altogether. Right. Here, what Gen AI is doing is helping you in business decision making, mm -hmm. take products faster to market, learn quickly before you build a full product as an example, or build components of But product. if everyone else can do that, then your marketing costs by, by supply demand Likely. suit up. And hence, this is where you have to become smarter as a marketer, mm. right? Mm. Who's my audience? Mm. How do I get a better understanding of my consumer preferences? Mm. How do I then target that user in the, using the right channel with the right ROI, with the right, uh, you know, in, in, in you have ROAS in, in marketing terms as well. How do I get that? And which platform do I use to get that out as well? Mm. Which is why I think future business leaders will not need to just be a business leader and know the core fundamentals of business, mm -hmm. but will also need to know the advancements in technologies really well. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't imagine a business leader of the future of a large-scale business in India or anywhere for that matter not having understanding of how technology works. Because mm -hmm. they don't, they're not going to be efficient. Mm -hmm. But those who do will be 10x more efficient mm -hmm. in applying the technology to grow their business faster at scale. And do you feel it's going to be disconnected from time? Like in the sense, today you want to do more things, you need to spend more amount of time, right? But I think with, like my personal opinion with AI is maybe we'll work two days, three days. It's more about now effective decision making. Yeah. And that's what I was telling about Twitter as well, right? Like 
effective decision making has disappeared because most people are now going with whatever the public thinks is correct or wrong. Correct. And that in real life businesses, it's almost all wrong. Yeah. Right? Do you feel like effective decision making? It's not about running the ad yourself, right? At some point, Facebook will run, like I think Facebook already kind of automatically right. runs ads. Right. But what to run and why? The the how rather than and the the why rather than the how. You feel the why has become more important? Absolutely, absolutely, a hundred percent. And I think which is why if I just go back to and just connecting back a little bit to what we're doing at Scalar also, you know the entire thesis behind Scalar School of Business that we're just launching right now, which is a eighteen month program. Um, the entire thinking behind that is to teach you by making you do things. So this aspect about effective decision making, uh, the why behind it learning consumer preferences, then applying technology to take your product to market. So how do you think of a business idea? How do you take from concept to reality? Mm. Then how do you build an MVP? Mm. Then how do you reach out to consumers, mm. generate revenue, know what the business fundamentals are going to be and what the economics are going to be, and then go and pitch it to a VC? Do you give, do you give uh, the students an ad budget? So yeah, as part of the project, right? so when, they, when they're building a project, what they end up doing is, so we have something called Scalar Innovation Lab, mm. which is on campus itself. That's a shared space between our students from SST, mm. Scalar Solar Technology, mm. and Scalar Solar Business. Nice. So it's and like a Y Combinator. It's like a Y Combinator way, exactly. Yeah. And we, what, what you basically have is business students collaborating with tech students. Almost you have your in house tech team, design team, and your marketing team in some Yeah, way. I think Rocket Labs is the better. This That's another good example. Yeah, yeah, a good parallel out there as well. Students come together, work on an MVP in the Innovation Lab itself, build that product, take it to market, maybe take a marketing budget start getting some revenue out of it. So the tech guy tells the marketing guy, tu ad chalaega, you will get users. Haan. And the marketing guy says, I trust that you'll be able to build the product. Haan. Or ye idea hum saath mein hai, and we'll take it to market. Or ye chal gaya, not only that, Scalar will then bring top VCs and investors mm-hmm. in a room and we'll idea pitch the idea and we'll show how much revenue we generated. And the value prop in this is when these two are talking to each other, the, the developer and the marketeer, uh, all the usual problems of startups are going to start appearing, right? Like one guy is exactly. like, usne ye bola, but nahi kiya. That guy said he'll be here today, he wasn't here. And no theory can teach you that. Yeah. The thing is, no traditional business program, no books, no theory can teach you any of that stuff. Conflict. Conflict, right? Yeah, right. Wo jab aap, when you're there and you're building it yourself in the middle of the action or you're taking a real world project. Mm-hmm. Let's say I get your project from, to give example, let's kill a technology. We have projects that we are doing with some pretty large startups. Like I think some of the names you can make, take is like Zolo as an example, an urban company. Recently did a project for the government of India, Bashini project. When you take that project, you start building it, you start realizing the complexity of building it. What hmm. theory you can study, right? You never get the understanding of what it takes to build it real time. Now imagine the business leaders, why in the B school, doing this with in collaboration, building the product and taking it to market. All the real problems. Is this even a problem? Hmm. Does the customer even want this solution that you're trying to sell? Right? right? Uh, taking quick feedback, iterating on the product very quickly, going back to the consumer. Again, taking feedback, iterating quickly, right? Mm-hmm. Managing customer support, then marketing for it, then sales for it, and then how the PNL sh- uh, comes together, mm-hmm. and then taking it to this would be very hard to pull off offline on online. It can't be done online. Like I would say, so far I have not figured out how how it could be done. Yeah. Especially like you showed me a video of that hardware thing, right? Where people are building that. Right, right. Uh, uh, yeah. Firefighting drones. Firefighting drones. Yeah. 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 Very tough to pull like five people together, yeah. make them ship. Burning them, yeah. burning them midnight oil, send together in the classroom, ideating on a whiteboard together, prototyping quickly, try it out on the ground, come back, again prototype, again try it on the ground. Why aren't traditional colleges doing this? It Like, traditional colleges are also fairly smart. I mean, and there's a lot of revenue for them to lose, right? Like, I don't know why they're just like letting the opportunity slip. Yeah. Uh, my thesis is, I think it's a quality of professors, right? If you get somebody who's been successful 20 years ago, many of these professors haven't yeah. even been successful. They've just been teaching okay. all throughout, right? So, uh, why do you think they've, they've not caught yeah. up to the opportunity? I'll give my three reasons. Maybe a can add later. I know first you already touched upon. I think the fact that they limit themselves to professors who come with strong theoretical backgrounds or research backgrounds. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, have not spent time in industry. Mm-hmm. So they're, they're not been there, done that. Mm-hmm. The big difference that we want to make sure with both the School of Technology and the School of Business is to make sure that every part of the program is developed, moderated, and even delivered in some cases by industrial leaders themselves. Mm-hmm. So for example, if you're doing a case study, and let's say the case study is about logistics mm-hmm. or transportation for that matter, can an existing leader of Uber India come on campus and review your case study and your outcome and then basis that maybe even offer your PPI right there itself. Mm-hmm. That real experience does not happen. So that's number one because the professors that you have 
come from both theory and research versus but, your but why readers. don't they have the access they are either limited and that's my second point right so they are either limited by um, the aspect of evolution that i, I need to evolve mm. right because i've not been challenged so the complacency kicks in mm. and that was my second point i think complacency plays a big role mm. i've been now for 30 40 years it's been working the way it has been working i've been getting students the way they're coming thousands right now thousands of crores a year i'm getting thousands of crores every year what you're missing out right now is business is evolving so rapidly technology is evolving so rapidly that unless you're able to get those students up and running outside i mean look at the stats out out there right now whether it's engineering stats whether it's mba stats employability of every single graduate is questioned right i mean you have terrible stats right now one out of four mba students are employable right one out of 10 engineering students are employable mm-hmm. the reason for that is because you're not learning from the industry you're not staying up, up to speed in the industry complacency and third is the curriculum itself the curriculum itself does not go through significant revamp see the cost of constantly changing the curriculum and hence bringing new professors who can deliver that from the industry is very high mm-hmm. it's not a low cost it's pretty high right some of the colleges are not able to understand the how do we keep evolving the curriculum and bringing the right quality to keep teaching that so they're stuck in the same old curriculum that's been prescribed and running the way it is like even today if you go to some of the engineering colleges for that matter they will still make you do mechanical filing in the first of engineering I, I did that yeah even if you are you're a CS student yeah i did lath and all that yeah right i mean if you go today to a business school for that matter you're still stuck in learning the four p's and the three c's yeah world has moved far beyond that sure you need to know the four p's and three c's so you have to have the understanding of the core business fundamentals but unless you've taken that and applied it yeah. in your period of there when you expose to the real world suddenly what happens especially conflict you can't teach conflict, conflict. you can't teach organizational management i mean think about how the uh, companies are going to be structured in the future with the advent of ai a lot of the company structure is going to change right yeah. customer support as a function is going to change sales enablement as a function is going to change yeah. right uh, so how do you stay in touch with that a lot of legacy institutions are not able to keep up with it mm-hmm. versus i think the new age programs are coming in business programs or tech programs and i think that's where i think we want to be at the forefront for both with technology a school of technology and a school of business is to ensure we're constantly evolving our curriculum so we are very uh, adaptable tomorrow after a year a new technology comes in which becomes very critical for students to learn we're able to in- incorporate that almost immediately mm. so we are always preparing you for the future hence when you graduate you're still relevant for the next decade or more versus what's happening in traditional colleges when you graduate you're still relevant for the last decade mm. not in for the current time unfortunately there's also a very very strong like test prep market right that that actually it's like i i can see the complete picture now right like there's a college that you end up obviously the the highlight college is the iits or like nits or whatever they're on top and bits and what not right and then there's like a tail end of colleges that you know can go from sort of good to like you know just a real estate company where you're paying rent uh i feel like to enable that there's now like a test prep race there are a bunch of exams and the exams are like sort of regulated so you know there's no scam going on there but the test prep thing i feel is like very unregulated i've also seen that you were telling me it has sort of lottery ticket dynamics right can you explain that for us like how does it work if i if i start with some numbers right uh, every year about 1.5 million 15 lakhs people uh, buy the je form fill it and then i think about 2.2 million to 2.2 million people who buy neat form and then if i go to higher education about 3 300000 3 lakh people who buy cat form and fill it mm-hmm. right well india is a country of scale right these are the kind of numbers which when i talk to my friends in in europe and us like like holy cow like what kind of numbers are you talking about that a single exam on a single day or maybe spread across two days 2 million people are going to write that exam right mm-hmm. uh So in India I think that thing does exist. Similar thing also exists for UPSC for example, right? That there would be few hundred people who are going to get selected and few million who are in that race. Uh India is of course a developing country, right? And uh, second layer of interesting uh, stats and distribution I can talk about. If you on the Google Trends search about that in which area is the high search frequency of terms let's say UPSC. Mm-hmm. you will see that it is inversely proportional to the per capita gdp of the state mm. highest search density wow. of upsc is in bihar mm. in rajasthan mm. while in gujarat maharashtra tamil nadu the search frequency of this term will be much lower mm. right so these test prep exams kind of become a kind of only ladder for upward social mobility 
in areas where are no other opportunities a gujarati 70 year, 17 18 20 year old kid would say i don't need to be in that rat race there are so many plenty of opportunities around me if i put that much hard work there i would have a fantastic career you know bhavik probably you would have never given iit je uh, fun fact <laughs> i don't know what jw was when i was studying engineering in bombay right. i don't know what jw was right. me on the other hand where i come from because in my village there is no other way for me to you know kind of do anything for me preparing for je or preparing for nda was the most important thing when i was in school right so i think that first is that that is the only kind of upward social mobility right now when we talk about this the level of competition that exists now let's say if i the numbers are so so crazy if i simplify let's say if there are a million people writing an exam and if i want to study in a top institute in india computer science then my all india rank need to be more like 1000 or so right when i went to apply to hyderabad i was in that range now 1000 top 1000 rank out of a million people who are writing the exam is 99.9 percentile it's as much as almost winning a lottery right now if i want to win this lottery there are two levels of ticket that i have to buy the first level is of course i have to buy the 1000 1500 rupee ka the je form fill it what a business right and yes 15 15 1.5 million into even 1000 rupees right that's 150 million dollar if i am doing the math right <laughs> uh or 15 million uh the second part is then that is one you know that's one opportunity the other is then comes to the coaching institutes because just having bought the form is just entry into the raffle now to really increase any odds then you want to maybe either do a coaching and then second level even coaching is a very high effort right mm. uh the second level is that you know there are let's say uh 5000 6000 rupee app program that you can buy mm. now the fascinating number is that about 1.1 1.5 million people every year buy those as well mm. if you might as well buying the form you might as well buy yeah, it yeah you are buying a 2000 rupee form so maybe you buy a 6000 rupee ka course and maybe you get lucky and maybe you get lucky right If you look at the completion rates or real outcome of those, it will be even less than one percent. Mm. That's always just samples buy. You know, like it's just like you are buying the lottery ticket and you are hoping that maybe it will happen. Mm. Uh, But you know, it's actually worse than buying a lottery ticket because, like we've discussed in the previous in in the beginning, right? Some of those people competing against you, or that two million, ten million, whatever number yeah. is, right, are freaks of motivation. Yeah. The freaks of nature. You just can't see it in their muscles or their body. You can. It's it's in their brain. and they will sit burn the midnight oil till like they don't sleep they sleep like 4 hours and and that's why and it's also like uh if you if you watch some of these movies right like, like 12th fail and all there'll always be like one or two characters who are like freaks of motivation who get by in the first round right but i feel like the entire this is so hard to kill in india like test prep simply because there's just so much money made it's it's illogical to to kill it i think what i see is it's a cultural and also socio economic evolution that will happen mm. uh the reason for example there is not a huge test prep market in gujarat because there is so many opportunities in business mm. right even in us for example if i take another extreme example in us while almost all the kids give sat but there is no huge Achoo. sat coaching business there people prepare they study they give an attempt they get some marks they figure it out not having scored great in sat would never be cause of making a kid suicide or you know even think about that he my life life is over unfortunately in our country it it becomes so much that you know maybe we make movies around few 100000 kids would feel that if i do not scale well scale, score well enough in je then my life is over i am a failure for life and that's the biggest bullshit that someone can believe in right but but the society makes that happen yeah the parental pressure and society. and the movies mm-hmm. and the movies yeah well yeah. fail yeah no and i think uh, one thing that i would emphasize is that get one clearing or not cleaning exams working hard for them definitely worthy like it's respectable thing but thinking that result of that exam is going to define your life is is absolutely not right unfortunately a lot of our web series and uh, i think movies etc sometimes they are even funded by the businesses which benefit by the you know coaching industry but i think that sets that uh, theme in the whole society hmm and that's why you feel because it's like it's making so much money it's like very hard to disrupt it yeah. right like and the minute you charge too much yeah. 
Uh, I know that, for example, with SSB, right, like with Skiller School of Business and even SST, they're reasonably mo much more expensive than going and doing one of these. But I feel like a lot of people will anchor you to that price in a way. They'll be like, oh, the other course is like 5,000 rupees, right, to get into a competitive exam or to whatever. Why is yours so much more expensive? They get the offline part and all, and they understand there's some, um, you know, uh, extra expense for that. But why is it so much more expensive? Without understanding that the completion rates are the, there are quite low, if my understanding is correct. Right. I think the difference is between whether you are buying a lottery ticket or are you really, you know, kind of investing into your learning and, you know, real outcomes. It's almost like a probabilistic odds, right? Yes. You have to multiply the 6,000 rupees into 1% to see the... To see the real price. To real see the price real of that, price. yeah. Uh, you, you actually have to divide it by 1% yeah. to see the real price. And also, I think, two other aspects to it. One is that you're also investing and in having experience that will stay you, with you for much longer, right? Your, your test prep, Done, results come, done. I know it's an unfair comparison, but... It's an unfair comparison, right? But you're talking about a program. Let's say you take the Skills School of Business program. Mm. Now, in those 18 months, while you're investing 20 lakh in fee, mm. in that 18 months, the experience that you're gaining, mm. interacting with industry leaders, having top CEOs come on the campus, talk to you, having, you know, case studies that are being um, proctored and, and reviewed by industry leaders themselves, building a product while you're on the campus, mm. um, Pitching to top VCs and investors, that experience that you're pretty much cramping in an 80 month period is now going to benefit you for many decades to come. That exam that you just did was a one time, at that point of time, requirement of a success or a failure that you had. This experience now stays with you for the next many decades. So that when you transform yourself from maybe just a average associate in a particular company to a manager or a senior manager or move up or pivot or maybe become a founder for that matter and start your own company. You know, a lot of students, when you think about at least the program at SSB, we think about students that are going to come in are likely going to have three parts. They're either going to pivot, which means they'll change the field that they're in. Maybe they're at, in, the, in the tech field, but they want to go to consulting or marketing. Mm -hmm. Or they're going to build. They become founders, mm -hmm. right? Or they're going to grow, which means they go from like a marketing associate to let's say performance marketing manager. Mm -hmm. Irrespective of the path you're going to take, the learning that you're going to have cramped in that 18 months is going to stay with you for decades. Mm -hmm. and, and like I go back to today to some of the things that I learned back in during my B school days. Mm -hmm. Right. And okay, this is what I learned back then. This is still useful for me out here now. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's obviously unfair comparison to test prep in general. But when you're spending that amount, you're spending it for the experience, the exposure. And completion rate. Like main and thing completion. is completion, right? Like it's so easy to quit any of these things that is like just having some some yeah. peer pressure there and people there saying finish, finish, finish is a very big deal. I mean, and of course, there's one additional aspect to which is ROI, right? Mm -hmm. If I'm spending that 18 months, I'm spending 20 lakh rupees, what am I expecting as an outcome of it? And what are the outcomes? I assume there are jobs at the end. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, like I said, I think, you know, there are tech jobs and the non-tech jobs both open up as avenues for you after you complete this PGP and management technology here. So, for example, if you go for non-tech jobs, like I said, you could be a marketing associate, you want to become a performance marketing manager. Mm. You're a sales associate, you want to become an enterprise sales manager. Mm. Now, these are typically significant jumps in your in your salary as well, right? I mean, those can pay you as much as 30 lakh rupees or higher mm. in some of these positions. You want to maybe go into becoming a category manager for an e-commerce company. Or for, uh, for the other, maybe you want to switch over to a startup and join the founder's office as chief of staff. Mm -hmm. So you need to have understanding of strategy, but you need to understand also all the different facets of business. Because mm -hmm. in the founder's office, you need to know the en entire business by itself, mm -hmm. right? And all the different facets of it. Uh, or for that matter, maybe you want to switch over to, um, in the tech side of it, I want to become an engineering manager or a product manager or a technical pro program manager. Mm -hmm. So this program, what it's supposed to do to you is give you this 18 month experience mm -hmm. of applying all your concepts in the real world, mm -hmm. expose you to the industry, and land you to a position where you either want to pivot or you want to grow or you want to build. You know, I've seen this in my own behavior, uh, at least when we hire people, right? Like three, four years ago, you know, to hire for a business role, like we were very unclear. We'd just look at a resume and we'd see whatever, right? Today, but we hire a lot from alt MBAs. Mm. We don't, we still don't hire too much from traditional MBAs because we feel they're far behind the curve. But especially alt MBAs, we've had a good experience of hiring a few people. Yeah. In fact, one of the guys who runs one of our units is like, damn good and he's from one of the alt MBAs. Mm. In fact, that's the next question, right? Like there are some of these popping up now. Yep. I think there's you guys, there's Master's Union, there's Stoa, there's a bunch of others. How do you differentiate versus them? Yeah, um, I'll take a stab at it first. Mm, please jump in. But So I think, firstly, I think all of them are good in their own aspects, 
right? They all the are safe answer. <laughs> no, no, I'll, I'll answer uh, further down also, right? Like, see, ultimately, what they're doing is they all have a, they all have understood there's a gap, which is very evident. Yeah. Which traditional colleges are not able to fulfill because the skill requirements of the industry and the skills imparted during your time on campus that I agree with are far apart. Yeah. And hence, they all have identified their uh, the difference and they say, okay, we want to play a role in minimizing that gap as much as possible. So they're all addressing it. So one, I think they all have their own kind of strategy for it. In that aspect, just like how you were for traditional MBA pro, uh, programs, you would probably say for, if I want to specialize in HR, mm. here's a college that I think is better. Mm. If I want to go for finance, I will likely end up choosing a college in Bombay. Mm. Right? Like Narsi Moji is a good example if you want to go finance as an example. If I want to specialize, for example, in operations and strategy, maybe there's an MBA college that I have preference towards. Mm. Same also will happen to the alt MBAs or the new age MBA programs that are coming. So they'll start specializing in specific. Specializing. Now each one will play their own kind of advantage, right? What we fundamentally believe and why we got motivated was launching Skills for Business is fundamental belief is that future business leaders will need to have an understanding of how technology works. Got it. So that's why the SST. Like that's why the fact that SSB is on the SST campus and the collaboration happens, which is why industry leaders come in grade you on that as well, give you case studies to work on that as well. You work on a project and we also include things like deep analytics. Mm -hmm. Now future business leaders will need to know how deep analytics works. So when we say tech enabled curriculum, we're not talking about coding here. You don't need to have prior coding experience. You don't need to be from a tech background, nor will we teach you coding in the MBA program. Mm -hmm. We are still going to focus on the core fundamentals of business theory as well as practical across all facets mm -hmm. with an additional advantage of a tech part because one, we are tech pioneers. We've done that before. Future leaders will need to know technology. That's a given. And actually, there's an interesting observation that I think Abhimanyu should share about. We were discussing this in the car on the way here about businesses in top 20 businesses in the US, China versus India. Maybe he'll talk about that in a bit. But incorporating this entire scale innovation lab, teaching you deep analytics and tools required for analytics, or teaching you how to use Gen AI to do a quick prototyping mm -hmm. and dirty A-B testing, are important aspects what a future business leaders will require. Mm -hmm. And that's why we want to bring in Scalar School of Business because I think we are uniquely positioned compared to all the other names that you mentioned because we have this innovation lab, we you have Scalar School of Technology. You'd be more like a tech uh, business sort of hybrid. Yeah, we are at the cusp or the intersection of business technology because that's where we believe all the business trends are evolving and some interesting observations you want to talk about. No, so it's a very interesting thing that uh, I think India is like, I'm very bullish on India for various reasons that maybe later I can talk about. And as, as uh, right now it's election going on. Um, so, you know, like there is a very clear mandate and kind of directional set that India is going to be 30 trillion economy, right? Mm -hmm. Now if you look at, there is US, which is already ahead of that. There's China, which is getting there. Uh, I strongly believe that in, in maybe in few decades, India will get there as well. Now, if you look at that, what kind of, right, now this 30 trillion economy or a 50 trillion economy is primarily driven by the organizations, the private companies, which are kind of scaling fast, right? If you look at top 10 or 20 companies in US, more than half of them are technology companies, mm -hmm. right? If you same, if you look at China, if you look at top 20 companies, more than half, like at least 30, 40% of them are already technology companies. And it is very clearly predicted that in next another five, seven years, mm -hmm. more than half of them will be technology companies. Like hell, I think top five are all technology companies in yeah. US, yeah. right? In India, on the flip side, right now, if we look at it, if you look at top 10 or 20 companies in India, none of them probably are technology companies today. Mm -hmm. Now this 30 trillion economy journey that is going to happen, it is bound to come from very large technology companies being created. Now who builds these companies, right? In US as well, if you look back at, if you go back time machine and if you look at that, what were the top uh, companies in 1960, 1970? It was very similar to what India has today. Most of them, maybe an oil company, maybe a transport company, maybe a courier company, maybe a bank, right? Now, you need a Eric Smith to build Google, right? Founders might do 0 to 1, 1 to 10, but you need these people who live at the strong intersection of the cusp of technology and management. I mean, Uber is another good example of that. No. Dara. Founders are great at 0 to 1, yeah. Yeah. So but they're not very Uber. good at but then Dara Travis built Uber, but Dara is the one who made it, uh, you know, a very profitable large-scale company. Uh, Google was built by the two founders, Larry Page. Uh, um, uh, right? That's like crazy random yeah. brain energy. They did yeah. fantastic 0 to 1, 1 to 10. But then Eric Smith came in and then built Google to put on the path of a trillion dollar company. Right? 
India would need a lot of such, you know, management talent. Why do you think it's not the founders? In many cases, like I've noticed this a lot. And in, 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 in some cases it is. Zuckerberg is still there, right? Uh, in some cases it is. But I think it's because the understanding that both have to go hand in hand. You can't be only a technology person and not understand what organizational culture is. How do I motivate teams? How do I manage my people? What kind of diversity do I require? What does diversity and inclusion really mean? If I look at marketing, what are the different facets of marketing? How consumer behavior is changing? You're still in the silo of the tech world. You're still seeing code around you. You're still apps around you. You're still seeing new technology around you. But you're losing perspective of what the consumer out there is actually looking for. If you're only business, you're essentially thinking of business always the way it was traditionally done. Mm -hmm. Right? And you're losing on the aspect of, again, how technology can advance business much faster, make me 10x more efficient. Mm -hmm. So fundamental belief, and that's why I'm seeing a uh, difference between some of the other MBA programs that you spoke about and, and why we still went ahead with launching Skill School of Business and looking for this founding cohort is because of this fundamental belief. And after serving the entire market, we realized that we are the ones who are uniquely positioned to offer this unfair advantage that we have. Because we have Skill School of Technology, because we are tech pioneers, because we are Scale Innovation Lab, and because we are, as a company, and the program is designed by folks who've been and done large businesses. I, I ran Uber, built it to a billion dollars. You have Manish Pansari, who's uh, a senior executive at Scalar. He was the ex-CX on Mintra, uh, leading operations to $400 million of Mintra alone. You have Abhimanyu and Anshuman who build businesses that are worth $700 million right now at Scalar. So when you have people at the helm of this, supported by some of the biggest names in the industry, whether it's Dipinder Goyal or Bini Bansal or Rajan Anandan, you're essentially getting an industry together to build this program. And then the unique advantage that you can have and what the benefit you can give the students only multiplies and compounds from there. No, I think that's that's pretty fascinating. And I think, I mean, I can now see, I was, I was a little bit of a skeptic, but I can now see the advantage that comes from having SST and SSB on the same campus, right? If you come into my company already having managed engineers, that's already a big win, mm -hmm. right? Whereas it would be very hard to hire somebody who's not had that experience and get them in. I'd have to look for an employee at a company who's done that previously, had like a few years of work X and brought that person in. So there's no fresher market for this, what you're talking about. And I think I can see that it potentially was. Is this for like young students or is this like for people who are already working professionals, one job in, two jobs in? So, who's it for? Yeah, I mean, I think we expect almost about 80 to 90% of our class to be made up of folks who are already working and looking for this shift that I spoke about. Either they want to build, they want to grow or they want to pivot. Mm. Uh, so I expect 80 to 90% of our classroom to be experienced folks who've done one or two jobs, have understood post their bachelor's and undergraduate that I require business skills mm. and these are gaps I have. Mm. You won't usually understand the gaps you have unless you've been in the business yourself mm. and experienced that, okay, you know what? This is where I'm lagging behind and now a B, B school program can help me. Mm. So usually it's always better coming into a PGP program with some years experience. Having said that, I do expect about 10 to 20% of our classroom to be potentially be freshers, but then they have to be exceptional. Either exceptional academics or strong achievements in any Olympiads, potentially have done you know, amazing projects in the past, maybe already been a founder while they were you know, in college kind of building stuff and tinkering stuff. Um, so I think we want the diversity also, right? Uh, diversity in form of gender, diversity in form of, of course, experiences, backgrounds. In terms of gender, like well. what, what, what's your goals? See, I think fundamental belief again, uh, and I'm a product of that myself, is that when you have diversity in gender as well, your learning experiences increase exponentially. Mm. Uh, not just because you meet like-minded people and from both genders mm. on campus that you can interact with, uh, you know, get to know, uh, but you also get different perspectives, which are often missed out. In fact, that's why there's enough stats out there that suggest that leadership uh, teams mm. that are diverse typically are more productive, take better decisions, and have a higher market cap than those leadership teams that don't have any diversity. Okay, I have one last question for you, important question, right? Like I think ultimately if somebody's spending 20 lakhs or 30 lakhs or 40 lakhs, whatever it is, right? I think there will be this added burden of, not burden, but a responsibility of giving them a job. Mm -hmm. So what's the, what's the placement network like? Who are the people that are involved? Uh, what kind of companies can people expect? I think that last end, of the ed education process I want to know from, you know, both both SST as well as SSB. 
I know that because Scalar's been around for a while, yeah. and I know you guys have like a good set of recruiters, you have relationships. And one thing we have learned is that it's a very relationship-driven business, right? Like, do you know the person? Can you call him up and say, hey, you know, these five guys are really good, you should interview them. Uh, and there also needs to be somebody on ground batting for you, yeah. right? Some placement person who's sitting, talking to your person, saying, you know, I'll talk to the recruiter. Thoda extra chahiye, okay, I will figure it out. So how does that process work? Like, what can people expect? So like you said, Scalar's been around for a while, right? And through this entire journey uh, of the online business that we had, Scalar Academy and Scalar DSML, we basically got a chance to place our students in over 900 companies across India and globally. Mm -hmm. Name the top tech companies in the country and chances you're going to find a Scalar alumni there already. Mm -hmm. Now what that does is it helps us continue maintaining relationships with all those 900 plus companies who are already rooting and batting for us. In fact, back a couple of years ago, Scalar Academy ended up placing more students into Amazon than all the IITs combined. So we've already built credibility with employers. Mm -hmm. Along with that, our own placement team, which is more than 50 people, by the way. So it's a pretty large placement team. All the 50 people kind of working on a placement team maintain relationships with these 900 plus companies on an ongoing basis, mm -hmm. right? Looking for opportunities, looking for what are they looking for in terms of skills, right? How do I make sure that I invite these companies on campus? So for example, at SST, since we spoke about SST as well, within one year we've had, I don't know, by now over 15 to 16 companies come on campus and do presentations already. Mm. You're talking about basically one company every two weeks mm. is coming on campus and doing presentations for our students. For them, for the student to join? Yes, for students to join, it's just employer branding. What do they do? What do they do? What kind of work is it? What can you expect when you join us? What skills are required? What skills will we assess for? So students know what to prepare for. That same network carries forward to Scalar School of Business as well. So you have a large placement team. You have existing relationship with large number of employers already. Besides that, you also have a strong network. Now we are funded by Peak15, Lightrock. They help us over up our network. Yeah. My background, I have a reach of certain companies. Abhi Mani has a certain reach of companies. Anshu Mandas. And we all take it upon ourselves as our own personal KPIs and KRAs, right? Mm -hmm. It's my own personal KPI to make sure that every single student of Scalar School of Business gets placed, or every student of Scalar School of Technology gets placed in a job that they would want to get placed in with as high probability as possible, if I can impart the But right. you can't place 100% of students. There'll always be one guy who just stops coming to college or whatever, right? I think driving adherence, of course, a student's effort is necessary. If someone just says that, you know, I'm not going to do anything, then probably we'll say that, you know, this is not the right place for you. You can just maybe leave the campus, right? Uh, but as of even as of today, for example, in every single class of Scalar School of Technology, Scalar School of Technology, we see at least ninety percent attendance. And again, it's rooted a lot in the culture, right? When there are hundred kids who are all passionate about it, even two who might be feeling little bit, you know, ki hai, I'm not really feeling that up. But when everyone else is doing so much, the probability of that reduces, right? Now, what I do understand is that more for even Scalar School of Technology. People will discover a lot of things. They will evolve in different ways. Someone might say that, let's say, I want to build an avionics company. I don't want to be a data scientist. I want to maybe build, you know, um, maybe Not defense fun. drones. Yeah. Or I want to, uh, you know, kind of uh, set up a startup. Or I want to do freelancing, right? Mm -hmm. We would rather encourage them to explore different kind of paths yeah. in their life, right? Uh, and that's why the, you know, the, the hope and dream to build a Y Combinator-like thing in India through Innovation Lab, yeah. right? So people will take their different paths as long as there is rigor, as long as there, there is curiosity. So for example, at uh, in our Skiller School ecosystem, we have this concept of RISE, right? Yep. Which is R-I-C-E, which is like respect, integrity, curiosity, and excellence. I think these last two, curiosity and excellence, as long as that is integrated, like see, you are not in a job, I am not in a job, but I think we are doing decent enough uh, for the world around. Yeah, I think the goal is not 100% employ uh, like 100% placements. The goal is 100% outcomes yeah. of what the students desire. Yeah, if they want to be an entrepreneur, they if 95% want a job, they get a job. If 5% want to go become an entrepreneur, they get a, become an entrepreneur. Maybe some of them even want to maybe go pursue masters or PhD if they really choose to, yeah. or I want to go abroad and maybe just tinker with something. I have their option. Yeah. Our goal is can we provide 100% outcomes yeah. of what you desire? Interesting. I have one last question for both of you guys, and mm -hmm. this is more like a rapid fire type of question, right? Which is one counterintuitive insight you have had about students, which nobody will agree with you on and which you don't want to tweet about <laughs> from each of you. Uh, yeah, I don't know if it's, if it's very counterintuitive or not. Uh, but I do see that 
students today are far less satisfied with their own achievements mm. than I think you and I used to be. I think even a small win for you and I, we would celebrate that a lot. And I think social media is playing a role in students feeling that I need to do more constantly. Mm. So this, this constant belief that I'm not happy yet. And I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough yet. I'm not, I'm not satisfied yet. Which actually works sometimes in their favor mm. of just pushing harder, working harder and getting better results also. It's like the peer pressure environment you're creating in SSB that's almost playing out on social media. <laughs> yeah, right? Where it's like, oh shit, Elon has done this other thing again. Now I got, now I have to do my next project at least. Yeah. See, the reality is the world is getting more competitive. The reality is that the requirements of what it takes from an individual to be more successful is, higher. is getting higher as well than what it used to be before. Mm -hmm. um, and counter to what you and I think sometimes that, you know, maybe youth today is traveling a lot more, they're more privileged, they watch more movies, they spend more, they have these expensive gadgets, you know, they're far more privileged than you and I used to be. Like for me, getting a cricket ball to play with of 10 rupees, I had to like argue with my dad for like 10 minutes to get a 10 rupees to buy a cricket ball that I could play with. Right? Today, we believe they're privileged, but counter to I think what social media also says, they don't take this privilege for granted. They are actually realizing that they're privileged, and hence, added pressure that now I'm privileged. I have to do more. Yeah. What about you? I think starting with the 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 learning mindset of the students, right? So often, education system is very geared towards, in a way, if I may say, beating the fallen. Mm -hmm. That the students who are not performing well, it is immediately labeled that they are, you know, they are just not motivated enough. They're not hardworking enough, etc., mm -hmm. etc. Uh, what I feel is that generally that is always rooted in uh, the education system not being able to generate the curiosity in them. Mm. The moment, let's say I have to teach a subject, let's say I want to teach students how to, you know, let's say uh, build applications, you know, let's say I want to teach them front-end engineering or back-end engineering. One way of taking the class is that I go teach them there's a lecture being given, they're supposed to take notes, then there's an exam going to happen. And then I'll say that, oh, these people are just not motivated, they, you know, none of them are really doing anything. And when you flip it over, the moment you give them high agency, you give them that, what do you want to build? Mm -hmm. You know, and why should you build that? Right? And then you give them, like, in a way you invert it, that now you want to build it, figure out how you could build it. Mm -hmm. And I'm there to support you. Someone says that, let's say, I want to build a multiplayer game. You know, they were, where, let's say, there are four players who can just play this online from four different locations. And then you probe them. There's this uh, Socrates method of teaching, right? That you ask question, how would that happen? How would four computers who are sitting across four different parts of the world communicate with each other? Then you introduce, there's a concept called socket programming to do that, mm -hmm. right? Then the learning changes massively. Mm -hmm. But I think the counterintuitive counter thing here is that you have to trust the students. And you just have to build curiosity in them and let them be. You have to do what they are interested in, not what the curriculum is. Right, right, right. right. You figure out and maybe first responsibility of the teacher is just to get them interested in, into something. And once that happens, give them a lot of freedom and be their support to keep walking that path. You feel the reason a lot of these students fail then, according to you, is because they also pick the wrong streams then? Absolutely. Or, or even the stream they are in, they never know why is this important, how is this relevant. I can talk about myself in my school. I, I was a good student. I was super hardworking, hopefully decent enough at brains as well. I would solve the hardest of the problems in differentiation and integration. Mm -hmm. But until I went to college, I never knew what is the practical use of it. The moment I realized, ki, oh, integration could be used for so many industrial applications. Mm -hmm. Differentiation could be used for so many physics problems. Right? It was a kind of mind-blown moment for me. If I was explained that in 10th class, I would have enjoyed learning differentiation and integration so much more. So you're saying it's poor quality teachers throughout? Throughout, all the way from first class to, you know, like having finished the engineering. Would you argue that, like, people who have not done anything useful in life go and end up being teachers? Oh. oh. <laughs> controversial. I'll tell you, uh, very controversial, but uh, at least I can talk about my journey, right? And this is, this is actually a fact. In most premium institutes as well, the people who 
couldn't end up with anything else. Most of them would end up becoming associate professors at private universities. That's a fact. Yeah. I think, and, and that's why I think one of the core principles behind building the scale of school, both the School of Technology and School of Business, is we are not getting your typical traditional, you know, theoretical writing on blackboard professors, right? These are individuals who have worked in the industry before. They've, for SST, for example, they've been VP of engineering at Snapdeal, or they've been a senior engineer in one of the top tech companies. Fundamentally believe in the mission statement of skills for technology that we need to revamp tech education in the country. And hence, I have a passion for teaching the next generation of builders because I want to create the next Sundar Pichai or the next Satya Nadella from India. So they've left their jobs, come on uh, to Skills for Technology and teaching here. Same host for Skills for Business as well, right? Uh, and which is why industry leaders associating themselves out of Scalar Campus for both the School of Technology and School of Business. Yeah, the only problem with getting like really good people to teach is it becomes very expensive. Because the smartest people wouldn't come work with you. And hence this. the pricing of a program, right, to some extent is not on the lower end either. It's not super expensive either, right? It's not on the lower end either, right? It's priced at a point to allow us to bring such quality of teachers to you so that your experience is not compromised in that four years of skill school technology or in those 18 months of the school of business. The second insight. Yeah. You had one more insight. Yeah. The other one is, I think, more on... Um, the collaborative learning part, right? Again, often a common belief in India has been that, you know, that the unstructured time people spending together is unproductive. Hmm. People often say, yaar ye ke ke gappe lagane mein time waste mat karo, padhai karo, book kholo, padhai karo. Hmm. right? But within Scalar Campus, that what I see is, again, it's a, it's a function of the right culture, hmm. right? Students, of course, you know, they are learning a lot in the classroom, but I do see that a lot more learning also happens outside of the classroom, mm -hmm. which be, could be happening just in their hostel rooms. It could be happening in the innovation lab. It could be happening in the, just on the ground and some people chit chatting. Mm -hmm. I think just a few days in the night, I was in the campus and some of the kids were trying out their drone. They are doing the test flight of the drone they are building, right? Mm -hmm. All of this is unstructured. It's just exploration, discovery, iterations which is not curriculum bound. But I think this unstructured exploration is a very, very powerful thing. Yeah. And which the impact of that... Of the whiteboard. Of course. <laughs> yeah. And the third, I think another counterintuitive insight that I so also feel uh, is more related to the selection process. I think the selection process, like with all humility, I would say, and I think that's the case with most um, uh, institutes which produce high impact leaders. It's not for everyone. Uh, it does not mean that the person we are having to say no to is not capable. Mm. It just means that a scalar school of technology or scalar school of business might not be the right fit for them. It might not be the best environment for them. It's not one size fits all. Mm. Right? I had this experience. Um, so after school, of course, I was uh, attempting, uh, trying to get through JE into a good college and NDA, right? Mm. Uh, getting into National Defense Academy. And he also has a very, this very interesting thing, very, very steep selection criteria. Mm. And on day zero of your service selection board, these are all 17, 18 year old young kids who are going for service selection board, five day long interview process, right? And the commandant on day zero will tell this, that NDA is not for everyone. The selection does not mean that there is a linear stack ranking and only the best one gets in. Mm. It simply means that there is a particular shape of the hole in which a particular shape of the people fit perfectly. Mm. You not fitting into that does not mean you are not good. It simply means that the institute is meant for a particular goal, has a particular ecosystem, which is best fit for a particular kind of people. I think at SST we follow that very... Yeah, I think, clearly. shameless plug in here, but I think for those who are watching this podcast, I would say that applications for both Scale School of Business and Scale School of Technology is currently open, right? We are looking for a founding cohort at Scale School of Business, which classes commence in August. I think when you apply, you'll experience the... the Do you feel the, some people might feel bad, their egos might get hurt if you reject them? Because this happens a lot. No, no, that's what I want to emphasize very strongly. Yeah. That it's a particular kind of program with a very particular kind of goal in mind. Mm -hmm. Rejection does not mean that you are bad. Mm -hmm. 
it simply means and again the selection is a deep science yeah. it can never be perfect mm -hmm. it's just that that the measurement that we have today feels it's not the best place for you yeah, so it's not right fit for you or the program is not right for your requirements yeah. and your expectations so which is like you know i think when you go through one of the applications through us you'll kind of experience some of the differences or nuances that we've brought into the process itself of the selection to ensure that we handpick the right students for the experience i was talking about earlier as well um yeah but i think if you go the traditional way of just writing a competitive exam you know studying day and night for it uh, you're likely to end up with a cohort that those who don't make it will feel they're not capable enough and those who make it were anyway like you said the the freaks of nature in many ways they do well anyways right uh, but they may not be the most cohesive uh, set of students who will add value to the program or the program will add value to them for us that's the most important emphasis that i want to i want to drive here that our entire application process that we have currently ongoing for both the programs is driven towards this can the students add value to the program and can the program add value back to the students lovely this is a very insightful conversation i learned a lot about education i learned a lot about offline education uh, it isn't as simple as it seems uh, at least from the outsider's view and congratulations on you know doing ssb and i think scalar you know i've been following for a very very long time every time i speak to you i get new insights about in general everything from test prep to like how education chal raha hai like how is it evolving and, I, and we've all seen it evolve like 10 years ago it was something very different yeah. now it's something very different i'm also pretty excited to see you know how you guys integrate ai into you know at least the usage of the tools into yeah. uh, the program i want to see how that impacts business leaders right like interesting to see how business people will use uh, ai so i think um, yeah congratulations on launching this and i you know hopefully i'm able to hire some people from you know the the next batch or the batch after that and contribute in some way thank, thank you so you. much bye